Thank you very much. I'm honored to be invited to participate in the Kalinga Literary Festival. I'm glad to hear that this is the third edition. And I completely agree with one of my previous speakers who expressed the hope that this would continue to gather strength and that over the years, the Kalinga Literary Festival will come to occupy an honored place in the various literary festivals that are now being organized all over the country. <coughs> I think this rash of literary festivals is proof itself of both democracy and development. For the idea that you can get together literary figures and have them share in company with each other and sometimes in contradiction to one another, uh, their thoughts on literature, the influences on literature, and the influences that literature has on society is in itself a demonstration that democracy has grown very deep roots in the country and that we have learned how to contain differences between ourselves without having resort to violence. Verbal violence, yes, but physical violence, no. It's also true, I think, that uh, literature itself uh, has been developing along with the spirit of the nation. For if one harks back to the kind of novels that made a big impact on society before independence and at the time of partition, we find that there is a certain anguish, a certain angst that is written in between the lines of the literary works that were given. For example, Mulkraj Anand's famous novel of the 1930s, Kuli. The atmosphere in Kuli is one of uh, depression and oppression. It deals with uh, a segment of our society which had been oppressed for millennia. But the oppression is unrelieved. And it appears as if there is really no outcome except that you have to accept that the kind of misery through which the principal character in that book lives is a misery that is being decreed by a very cruel fate and which will remain in, in the lives of the people of this category <coughs> into eternity. And if I take a novel that came out about 20 years later, soon after we became independent, I'm thinking of uh, a book called uh, Nectar in a Seal. One finds that uh, the author is again dealing with displaced persons. The novel is set uh, in the region of Madurai, Tamil Nadu. And uh, they are a displaced family. They come into a city which is uncaring and callous. And they get some relief during the course of the book. But it is nectar that drips onto them through a seam. It is not as if good fortune dawns upon them. And one cannot imagine a Chetan Bhagat writing in the 1930s or 1940s. Just as it is almost impossible to imagine the kind of unrelieved misery which you see in uh, Mulkra Janand or the author of Nakhtra Nasim Kamla Markandeya in this 21st century. There is a kind of buoyancy in our society that has been induced by the proof that society and the economy can be changed. For let us not forget that in the colonial period, running up to our independence, society seemed so completely static and the economy so incapable of growing that there was very little hope, except the hope that was linked to the prospect of freedom. That's where Rabindranath Tagore takes his own. He envisions an India of the future and is not completely constrained 
by the India of the present in his day or the India of his past. And that is where a poem like where the mind is without fear and the head is held high emerges as an expression of hope and aspiration. But into that heaven of freedom, my father, let my country awake, can only be written of a country which has not yet woken and has not found where it has woken. And thus we see that uh, a lot of literature relating to that period, I'm talking of the pre-independence period, is either full of misery or it is based on distant hope or it throws itself backwards and uh, seeks to be part of the Indian Renaissance. And I think Bankan, Bankan Chandra Chatterjee's book is part of that effort to retrieve an India that seemed to have been lost. And the irony of this is that whereas it was Macaulay's intention to enslave the Indian in his mind and make him an integral part of the ruling structure, the fact is that Macaulay's was the most major contribution to the dismantling of the empire within about a hundred years of his famous education minute. For when he did his education minute, he created a class of Indians that initially was completely bewitched with uh, how far the Western revolution in thought had taken and believed it to be strictly Western. Until soon after the first war of independence in 1857, the generation that emerged from about the 1870s and into the end of the 19th century began to ask itself the question that if all these wonderful liberal values are applicable in the United Kingdom to the English, then why should they not be made applicable by the English to India? And in the course of that, there was a kind of rediscovery by the Indian political elite of its own heritage, largely through Western sources. For instance, when one reads uh, Jawaharlal Nehru's The Discovery of India, he seems to need to validate the opinions that he is expressing by quoting from what Max Muller had to say, or quoting from what Andre Malraux had to say, or quoting from what Romain Roland had to say, or quoting from A.G. Wells about what he had to say. And uh, when it came to novelists like Mulkrajan and in Kuli, the audience obviously was, the desired audience was obviously a foreign one. <coughs> For he takes great care to translate idiomatic expressions into English instead of leaving it exactly as it is. Instead of telling the reader that if you find a French expression or a German expression, a Latin expression or a Greek expression in your literature, the author doesn't attempt to translate it. It's you who have to reach for your dictionary to discover what the meaning of that expression or that word is in the English language. But there is a kind of colonial inferiority complex that you find in Munkraj Anand, taking a very famed English swear word and translating it into English as, oh, thou seducer of thy sister, for a really filthy word that is, uh, that you can hear. If you don't, haven't heard the word, please see the film Urta Punjab and you'll hear it very often. So this kind of being influenced by the political milieu, being influenced by the social milieu, is uh, very, very strong in its impact on any kind of literature. For example, to take put the shoe on the other foot, when the Jesuits came to India, they came trailing with them uh, the, 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 the clouds of victory 
because all along their, germ, their journey past the coast of Western Africa, extending from just where the Sahara ends and right up to the Cape of Good Hope, they had enormous success in converting people to Christianity. And when they arrived in India, they were a bit bewildered as to why the Indians were not proving as easy a harvest for the Pope as they had succeeded in having not only in Africa, but also in the New World, as they called it then, the Americas, where it had been very easy for them to effect these conversions. And when they found that there was this adamant resistance all over the southwestern coast of India and into Tamil Nadu, there was a Jesuit in Madurai who came to the conclusion that this is because they have their own religious literature. And unless we are able to understand what is the significance of this domestic indigenous literature, religious literature, we won't be able to find the counter arguments. So he first translated Om Namo Shivaya into Latin and collecting a lot of uh, Sanskrit books, he sent them off to the Vatican for them to translate into Latin. And through Latin, which was the language of the learned people all over Europe, it got translated into French and English and German. And that is how people like Schopenhauer and Goethe woke up to the treasures of India's literature. And Max Muller woke up to the treasures of India's spiritual literature and then rendered these into English. And the Macaulay Ki Ola, who had been trained to become those who were going to run the empire for the British, picked up what their heritage was from English translations of European writers of the era just before imperialism became fashionable and desirable and thus came into our consciousness. So clearly, there is a major political influence that works upon this thinking. But by the time we come into the 20th century, and nationalism becomes a political credo, then to a very large extent, particularly in our own languages, what the Europeans call vernacular languages, there is an outburst of patriotism which is part and parcel of the literature of that time. And I would particularly commend Subramanya Bharati, for it was he who gave a kind of uh, music to his poetry and thereby converted the freedom movement also into a literary movement. That was in the South. In other parts of the country, there were, of course, other writers. But at the same time, the drag of our society upon our political aspirations was so marked that many of the great writers of that time, people like Munshi Premchand and later Sadat Hasan Mantu, they reflected on the underbelly of Indian society. And they too, their writings too, were infused with a kind of feeling that uh, these things can't change that these have anchored us down in such a way that we can't pull out of it and move forward. However, after independence, there is a note of hope that slowly starts seeping into Indian literature as well as the cinema, which has become a major medium by then for people with literary aspirations to express themselves. For some of our greatest poets in the post-independence era, people like uh, Sahil Yandi, are writing really for the film industry. Khwaja Abbas, writing for the film industry. And in writing for them, initially what Indian audiences want to see in say the early 50s or through to the mid 50s, the first decade of India, you get films like Pyasa or Mother India, which are really depressing. 
And then you start getting a slight shift towards social change through a film like Sujata, which uh, brings up what is a taboo subject, the possibility of love between uh, a non-Harijan or a non-Dalit and a Dalit girl. And it starts appealing to people. And then we come to what I would call the Bobby era, where it is no longer necessary to be pessimistic or wondering what life is going to give you, and to start showing a brighter side of life. We also got that in Hare Rama, Hare Krishna. And equally, these got reflected in our novels. And in our novels, we started seeing, I'm confining myself largely to the English language because that's the only language which I am familiar with. I am not a Mongolian ki olad, but I am probably a Mongolian ki pota pota. So, because of this, I would say there is a dramatic shift that takes place between Kamala Markandya writing Nectar in the Sea and about six years later, Nayantara Sagal writing a novel called A Time to Be Happy. The extraordinary thing about A Time to Be Happy is that it is a novel of nearly 250 pages in which nothing happens. There's no development of a storyline. There's no particularly dramatic opening. There certainly is no climax. But it is impossible to put down that book because it reflects so accurately the nature of our society between about the period of the Quit India movement and through the Bengal famine and into independence. And subsequent novels by her, like Rich Like Us, which begins with this, with this saint trying to persuade his guests to drink whiskey <coughs> and finding that they're a bit reluctant, insisting that this is Scotch whiskey, which I don't think you would need to write in 2016 because Scotch whiskey is available anywhere and everywhere. Whereas during the license permit Raj, there were many things that we take for granted today which uh, were unavailable except in the homes. And I quote the title of her book, Rich Like Us, People Who Are Rich Like Us. So society does get reflected. And now we have a boom in Indian literature in the English language which is completely unashamed, unlike its predecessors, uh, of using Indian expressions in a completely Indian setting and writing really for an Indian audience. And I begin with these chick lit novels. And some of these other works, like uh, Arundhati Roy's The God of Smaller Things, which really deal with an India which seems to be materially different to the India in which people like Mudrajanan or even Kushwan Singh in his train for Pakistan, train to Pakistan was writing. That is an India that has gone behind us. And we have novels as well as non-fiction about the period of the emergency and how much that was an aberration from the normal evolution of our democracy. And today, the underlying theme in much of our culture, irrespective of which medium it expresses itself in, whether it is films or television, literature or dancing or songs, there is, a, there is space for innovation. There's place for every form of that particular medium. And so where a dance performance would mean just Bharatanatyam, around about 1945, 1950. Today you would expect Odishi to take its place, you would expect Kuchipuri to take its place, you would expect Mohini Atam to take its place, without, without displacing Bharatanatyam. So there is a kind of opening of the cultural space in a way which was unusual and unique back in the 1940s. I say unusual and unique because in literature, there was an utterly remarkable book produced by a man called G.B. Desani, writing from the England 
of the immediate post-war period. It's a book called All About Mr. Hatter. But I suspect he was able to write it because he wasn't writing, although he was writing about India and about Indians, he was writing it from a different perspective of somebody who's very fond of milk in an era in Britain when milk was severely rationed. And uh, therefore, he keeps having the expression milk o. And then he plays with the English language in such an extraordinary way that he twists it, he turns it, he Indianizes it. Mr. Hatter is an Anglo-Indian who acts, who uh, functions in, in circuses as some kind of a clown. And what he does to the English language is not only to murder it, but also to show what its immense potential is. So one of his first great admirers was none other than T.S. Eliot, who said, English written like this has never been written before. And if Shakespeare was able to give a completely new tonality to the English language, even as before him Chaucer was able to do, so also is G.D. Desani's contribution, a breakthrough contribution. Then we had another novel by Raja called uh, The Serpent and the Rope. I've just forgotten his surname immediately. Yeah. Uh, Raja Rao, that's right. Uh, which again showed the potential of the English language in Indian hands. And perhaps the greatest master of this new genre of Indian English is Arundhati Roy. I'm not talking about her political writings, which uh, I'm a great admirer of her political writings, but many people are dead set against her for exactly the same reason. But if one looks upon her as a writer of fiction, then what she did with the God of Small Things is something that no native English speaker has been able to do. And last evening, while waiting for this uh, conference to begin, I read something by a Pakistani writer called uh, Our Lady of Alice Bhatti. And if you haven't read it, I'd really recommend it to you as an outstanding example of how English has been made into a subcontinental language. And this development has been made possible because we live in an atmosphere of free expression and an atmosphere in which we can laugh at ourselves. If you read Chetan Bhagat's on the two states, which I did, I could identify with because I married outside the Tamil community to a Sikh girl from Punjab. And many of the kind of incidents that take place in that book were a kind of parody of what I had myself experienced and therefore was able to relate to. But one can't really imagine that a book like that would have been written in the 1940s when it was utterly, utterly exceptional for people to marry outside their caste, their religion, their region. And uh, it was looked upon as a strange and aberrant thing for this to happen. Whereas now, if a girl actually marries into with a boy of her own caste and her own language and in the same region, it is a startled surprise that there isn't an English or a Swiss or a German father-in-law lurking in the background. So therefore, we do see the development of society, the development of the economy, the development of the polity reflected sometimes overtly, but much preferably in a, in a covert manner, in a subtle manner, in the evolution of literature. And that is why I imagine that increasingly, historiographers are looking upon the literature of that period as an important source material to discover what happened politically, or why there were economic developments of a particular nature. Thus, your theme, it appears to me, is, uh, unfortunately, there wasn't an announcement that we should switch off our uh, mobiles. So I forgot oh, there was. And typical of me, because my hearing is gone, I didn't hear the announcement. <laughs>
so I'm sorry that I uh, disrupted things for a moment. But I'll end now saying that this is a theme that uh, I have not, have not found explored at any of the other literary festivals that I've been at or heard about. But I do think it's an extremely important theme. And my congratulations to you. Thank you.